Good morning. It's so good to be together on this Lord's Day morning. We are we're just getting started on our theme for 2024, and there's a song we sometimes sing, Is Thy Heart Right With God? And our theme takes a more introspective view of that same idea, asking, is my heart right with God? This is going to be a year of self-examination, a year of reflecting on what the scripture teaches about our heart and examining our own hearts and becoming more aware and, and more thoughtful about the things that are happening in our hearts and what comes from it. Scripture, of course, has so much to say about the heart. So many verses. We've sang a bunch of songs about the heart, wonderful songs. Why, though? Why does the Bible talk about the heart so much? Why is the heart such a big deal? I mean, it's just, just one part of, of, of life, right? I mean, there's other things. There's things you do. There's words you say. There's all of these other things. But the Bible keeps coming back to what's within us, to what we're thinking, what we're feeling, what our intentions are, what our will is, this place, this seat of our whole inner life. So we're asking this question this morning as we kind of get started on this year of lessons. Why does my heart matter so much? And we're really going to focus in on one big, um, on one verse and one big idea that's in one verse here in a little bit. But I want to talk about a few other. This is it's going to be one short pithy saying that I think you'll be able to remember from the Bible, but I want to think about a few other sayings you may have heard before. Ever heard this saying, the grass is always greener where? On the other side. Irma Bombeck said, the grass is always greener above the septic tank. <laughs> but I always thought that was pretty funny, and there's some lessons there. But what does this mean? The grass is always greener on the other side. Here I am. And I'm looking out there, and I'm thinking, here I am in this job, but there's another job over there, that guy's job, that person's role, their career, that's what I want. I'm looking at another church, thinking, that church over there probably has no problems at all. I'm looking at another relationship, whatever it is, I'm thinking over there, it's so much better. Have you ever noticed that some people spend their whole life chasing greener grass and never seem to settle in and notice what's going on with them? They go from, the, back in, in Phoenix, there was a, a lot of people that we would just notice were, were never settled into a church for more than a year. There were a lot of different churches in Phoenix, and they would come, and they would go to one place, and then eventually they would say, oh, can't deal with those people. And they go to another place, and they're, oh, they're the worst, and they go someplace else, you know? Um, there are, we can do this with friendships. We can think, you know, these friends, there's such a, an issue with these friends. I can't trust them, and we move on. And we keep finding the same thing. These people were hypocrites, and there's hypocrites over there. These people, you couldn't trust them, and I resent them, and I resent these people too now. All over the place. You can spend your life doing that kind of work. Well, what's the problem? My grandpap had a different saying. He was one of those guys that went around just saying silly things that just make you think. And he liked to say, wherever you go... What's the rest? There you are. <laughs> it's so silly. It's so obvious. You just kind of can blow it off. But then you start applying it to yourself and thinking introspectively, you know, like our question for the theme, is my heart right with God? And you start to think, wherever I go, there I am. What is the constant in all of those jobs and all of those churches and all of those friendships? 
In every one of those situations, I'm there. And what do I bring with me? All the stuff inside me. And the Bible talks about that as the heart. I'm bringing my heart everywhere. The lens through which I'm looking at every person and every situation I'm carrying with me. All of my, all of my attitudes, right? All of my ways of thinking. And did you know you can have habits in your thinking? You can have, you fall into patterns, you know, our, our, our neural pathways like to follow those well-worn roads, just like we do whenever we're going on a path somewhere. You can start to have these patterns of thinking. And what are those patterns? Well, you're carrying them with you all over the place. Your desires. What do you want? What are your intentions? What are your purposes? What are your plans? Where, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also, Jesus says. All of this stuff, your feelings and your, your baggage, we sometimes call it, this stuff we carry around. And some of it's good, but some of it isn't. And it's all going with you wherever you go. There you are. What does the Bible have to say about this? Many, many years ago, thousands of years ago, God inspired some wise Israelites, among them King Solomon, one of the wisest men ever. And, and the book of Proverbs was assembled from these wise people. And there's this verse, and this is where we're going to mostly camp on this verse this morning. Proverbs 4.23, within this verse is a truth that has the power to transform, to revitalize, to strengthen and enlighten our whole lives, your life and my life. Here's what the Lord says in Proverbs 4.23. Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of of life. Keep your heart. Keep this, this inner part of you. Keep it. Pay attention to it. Keep your focus here where all of these things are. You know, we, it's so easy, it's much easier, I think, to pay attention to the things that come from all of this, right? You know, like your behaviors. When we set resolutions, we're thinking about, you know, those New Year's resolutions a month ago or a few weeks ago. We're thinking about things like, like what are we going to eat? And what, is, what are our financial habits going to be? And what am I going to exercise? Am I going to... You know, I want to do certain things, even spiritual things. I want to do things like I want a habit of reading my Bible every day. I want a habit of doing these things. And those things matter. It matters what we do. The Bible is so clear on that. But what we do comes from who we are within. Do you see what this verse is saying? Keep your heart with all vigilance, with all diligence, with all of your strength, with all your effort, because from it flows the springs of life. From it comes everything else. Your relationships, your, your work situation, your, your um, outlook on everything. And most importantly, your eternity is going to come from right within us. And he compares it to a, he uses a metaphor, to a spring, to the source of all of the things that are coming. Your life is out here, and your heart is the spring from which your life flows. 
Wow, that is pretty important. So I mentioned Phoenix. I grew up in Phoenix. And in February, you might prefer to be in Phoenix. In January, it's like today, you might prefer to be in Phoenix. But in July, it's a different story. It is pretty hot and uncomfortable outside in, uh, you know, after school at 3.30 in mid-July. And we were talking about grass. You would think in the middle of the desert, the grass would be greener here than there. They would have no green grass. But you go there and every yard has pristine green grass. You know why that is? It's not because of the rain. It's because of sprinklers. And I would, there, every yard has sprinklers all over. And we would come home from school, or in the summertime when there wasn't school, we would spend our afternoons a lot of times running through the sprinklers. This is what, this is what the kids who don't have pools do in mid-July in Phoenix. You just have a blast jumping through a sprinkler. And the water, at first you're kind of dodging it and, oh, that's pretty cold. You know, and at first you're, you're not sure, but then it feels good and you decide to just get in and you got your head down in the sprinkler and you, you're jumping through and your whole body is soaked as it's shooting out this water. And it's all over you. What the scriptures are telling us here, Proverbs 4.23 is your life is like the sprinkler. And everywhere you go, it's spraying all over until your whole life and the people around you and the situations and everything around you is getting soaked in your heart, the stuff of your heart. And that can be a tremendous blessing to you and to the world. Or it can bring poison and muddy, gross water all over everything around you. What are we carrying in our hearts? What are our habits? What is our thinking? Jesus, of course, talked about this, and he probably had Proverbs 4.23 in mind whenever he said, for instance, in Matthew 15, he said this several times, but in Matthew 15, he says, for out of the heart come evil thoughts and murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slanders. In other words, all the sin comes from the heart. He says in the verse before it, he's talking to the, to the disciples about how it's not what you eat that's going to make you unclean. It's not what you put in. What comes out comes from your heart, and that is what makes you unclean. He says, verse 17, do you not understand that everything that goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is eliminated? But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and those defile the man. So our words come from our heart. And then in verse 19, again, sin comes from the heart. All these actions he says in verse 20, these are the things which defile the man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile the man. In James 4 and verse 3 talks about how, verses 1 to 3 talks about how the passions at war within us can destroy our relationships, even with brothers and sisters. The things within. So we have to take responsibility for our lives by taking responsibility for our hearts. Look at the stream of your life and recognize that your life is the spring that sources the stream. And the beauty of this principle is that wherever you go, you have an opportunity to do this work because your heart is going with you everywhere you go in all of these situations. And those relationships are opportunities for heart work. Your, your problems at work are opportunities for heart work. Your situations, all, all of your life is an opportunity. Romans 5, 3 to 4 talks about how the, the problems, the tribulations and challenges we have are shaping us, are creating proven character that comes from the heart 
into our behavior, into our lives. And so through the difficulties, we become shaped into having the kind of heart that we want to have. He says, keep your heart with all vigilance. Keep it. And so the, the, the core, the, the commandment, the action item for us here is to keep. This is the charge from God. Keep it. Well, what does that mean? And how do we do it? How do I keep my heart? This word, it's, I mean, essentially it has a similar meaning to what our, our English word keep means, this, this Hebrew word. Um, the Hebrew and Aramaic lexicon of the Old Testament says it means to see and to look after, to care for, to keep watch, to watch over, to keep from, to protect, preserve, to observe, comply with. Uh, Brown's Driver Briggs says watch, guard, keep, preserve, keep, observe. Strong says to guard in a good sense, to protect, maintain, obey, or in a bad sense, to conceal. Then it says to, to keep or to monument, to observe, to preserve. And we know what keeping means. We know what a zookeeper, for instance, does. We had a young lady visiting with us for, I don't know, almost a year, it felt like. Emily um, has moved back to, to her hometown now but she was a zookeeper. And I thought that was a pretty cool job, and I loved to talk to her about what she did. And in fact, her job as a zookeeper was to keep my son's favorite animals at our Fort Wayne Zoo, the clouded leopards, amazing animals. They can open their mouth like this wide. It's a crazy angle, and they can leap like eight feet, 10 feet in the air, and fascinating creatures. So what was she doing as the zookeeper, as the leopard keeper? Well, she was watching them, tending them, caring for them, protecting them, observing them, feeding them. That's what it means to keep. When we think about being a heart keeper, your own heart keeper, nobody else's heart keeper, but your heart keeper. What are you going to do to keep it? Well, you got to watch it. You got to tend to it. You got to care for it and protect it and observe it and feed it. Right? I, when I was at my last, the last gospel meeting that I did down in Cincinnati, I left my preaching Bible. So I've got with me a different Bible, uh, my old New, New American Standard, and it's kind of nice because then I get another version to look at. And instead of saying, keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it comes the springs of life, the New American Standard says, watch, watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. Watch it. Whenever I ask someone to watch our kids, to watch over them, what does that mean? <clears throat> Well, they're sure going to need to pay attention to them. And they're going to need to notice what crazy thing they're about to get into. And to redirect them. And to make sure they're taken care of. They don't get into trouble. There's no danger that, that comes upon them. That they're fed. Maybe, maybe if we're going to be late coming home, then that they're in bed on a decent time, right? You're taking care. You're watching. And that takes close observation. That takes protection. That takes care. When we think about keeping our heart, I want to give you an a acronym to help you remember this idea of three different aspects of keeping the heart. And we'll call it mop. Let's talk about, about mopping up our heart. Maintaining, observing, and protecting. And you saw all of those words in those definitions of this, of this Hebrew word, but you, you get how we're going to need 
to tend to things, and we're going to need to watch over things, and we're going to need to guard things, maintain, observe, protect. So let's talk about each of these things that we need to do with our heart. You are your heart's maintenance specialist. You are the, the one that is in charge of the fine art of heart maintenance. I am not great at maintenance of a lot of things. <laughs> like if I was in charge of maintaining my car and I couldn't take it down to CarMax and say, okay, uh, I need to check up on everything. What does it need? We would be in trouble. We would, we would not be able to maintain the car very well. But the heart takes even more maintenance, more awareness, and you can't outsource it. You have to tend to it. Well, what is going to sustain your heart? Whenever something starts getting broken down, whenever your heart starts to, starts to get clouded with, with bad attitudes and thoughts about something, you start to have bitterness towards someone. You start to notice that, that you're flaring up in anger in the middle of a conversation. You start to see that, you know, you're feeding your heart something that is not really directing it in the right way. Well, it's your job to correct that. That's part of maintenance. To say, okay, how do I deal with this? And the Bible is full of strategies. This is your, your um, what's it called when you buy something and you, need, you get a, a proper care manual? This is the proper care manual for your heart. And it tells you, you know what? You need to confess whenever you're in the wrong. You need to acknowledge that before God. You need to turn away from it. You need to ask him for forgiveness. And that process is a cleansing a cleansing of your soul, a cleansing of your heart. You can't, you can't, if you don't deal with it in the ways that God prescribes, then you're stuck in it. The Bible talks about how we need to keep filling our heart with the word of God. Romans 12, 2 says that we are transformed. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds and how do we do that? How do we renew our minds? How do we re transform it? By taking the word of God into it, by reflecting on the right things. He transforms us. He shapes us. Our prayer life is a part of our maintaining of our hearts, the relationships we have, and how we interact with each other and, and work through things. Sometimes you just got to talk something out because you're stuck in something. And you find a brother, a sister, someone that you can think about this stuff with and get to the other side of it. Maintaining our hearts. This is something that Christians should be better at than anybody because we have the directions and we have the help of God and we have the spirit of God and we are charged by our Lord with this task. As we carry the gospel with us, people are watching what else we're carrying, and we're carrying our hearts with us, and we're carrying our lives with us. What does it look like for us to rejoice in the Lord always? What does it look like for us to be able to give freely without expecting a return? What does it look like for us to love, love like Jesus loves, to walk without being sucked into uh, to an inability or unwillingness to forgive and move on. But in order to do any of that, we have to do something that in some ways is even harder than maintaining. You got to know what's going on inside yourself. And um, men, let's be real. We don't like to think about feelings. As, as somebody once said on TV that I heard, I don't like the way emotions make me feel. <laughs> and for, for a lot of us men, our core emotion that shows up in those times of 
difficulty is anger. But what else is going on underneath the anger? What is causing that? Is there something that was said that you didn't realize? Is there something that you have done? What is going on? Are you stuck in a, in a particular thought and you're just feeding your, your, your um, you're in a loop of something negative and destructive? Maybe you're not even noticing. We have to take the time to stop and step back, stop all the doing for a minute, and think, observe, notice what is happening with your heart so that you can keep your heart. Keeping your heart requires you and me to know what's going on with us. And most people don't think about that. They don't pay attention. It's so easy. I mean, boy, I do it all the time. I realize that I've been on a, on a path and I, I never stopped to notice what that path was, what that thought process was. We have to become a people who is constantly aware. Jesus calls it, Jesus and the other, other New Testament writers talk about being watchful. Watchful. So it's about alertness. It's about noticing. Not just what's out there. That's part of it but also what's in here. We have to become the kind of people who observe. And, and boy, prayer is a great way to think through that and to work through that. As you talk things out, really talk things out, not just go through your, your rote prayer, but really talk things out about what's going on. What is weighing you down? What are you thankful for? Then uh, you're actually working through it before the person who knows you, before you even talk about it, and it can actually do something about it to help you. Finally, we need to protect our hearts. We need to guard. But we, we're not keeping our heart if we're not guarding it. And that means we have to notice what dangers are threatening our heart. What kind of influences are surrounding you? What are you taking into your thoughts? We have to be so vigilant and watchful because if not, we will go astray. The first Psalm is really about this idea of what are you feeding your heart or what are you taking in? The first Psalm talks about the input says, Psalm 1, how blessed is the man who does not walk, and these are some in influences, does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Who are you taking counsel from? Whether it's a person you know, or a blog, or a podcast, or a show, or whatever. Who are you taking counsel from? Who's filling your brain? Nor stand in the path of sinners nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night, and he will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And in whatever he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff, which the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous." but the way of the wicked will perish. We have to protect. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things. Well, that's, that's pretty scary. You know, also, all the Disney movies I watch just say, follow your heart. That's the answer. But what if your heart is deceiving you? And so there's this sort of metacognition, this stepping back and thinking about your thinking that we have to do and examining it in the light of the scriptures and in the light of, of a broader perspective, maybe getting some counsel from other people. You know, I remember being as a teenager in the throes of romance and you just, you just are being pulled around and it's easy to get swept up and, and pulled to a place that if you're thinking right, you, you don't really think is the right way to go. It's easy to get pulled by all kinds of emotions 
and desires and, um, and conflicting um, influences that are pulling at you. But we have to protect ourselves from those things and let the Lord lead us. Maintain, to observe, to protect. If we, if we do this, if we use the tools that the Lord gives us, and this is the beginning of a much longer conversation this year, then there is reason for people to, as 1 Peter 3.15 says, to look at us and notice the hope within us and ask, hey, in the midst of those troubles, why do you have hope? And we can tell them, well, I have a God. He has a son. And he has a way to give life everlasting, abundant life. He wants you to drink from this spring of living water. Water without cost, and you will thirst no more.